Well, Razorback fans, he does it again. Another portal addition for the Razorback basketball team. What is happening right now? You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 103.7 The Buzz. Dot com. Hope everybody's having a wonderful Tuesday as it just continues on <clears throat> with the craziness of the transfer portal. Oh my goodness. I, I'm just, I, I'm laughing about it. And if you're, if you're on YouTube and you're watching this and you see the little uh, uh, graphics that we make on here and I have LOL at the end of it because it's just like, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd what was happening right now in the transfer portal because Arkansas has added a fifth guy. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this because we'll, we'll get into that and also maybe the uh, rhyme and reason behind what Eric Musselman's doing in his staff at Arkansas because I know everybody's got questions about it. But essentially on Monday, the former Louisville guard L. Ellis, which is going to be something I'm going to screw up a lot, uh, committed to Arkansas. He's a senior. He averaged nearly 18 points last year for Louisville on four and a half assists as well as uh, starting every single game every single game for Louisville, and averaging 36 minutes a game. That's a ton. That is a ton of minutes and a ton of uh, uh, games. And I, you know, I mean, it's just, it's pretty, you got to give a lot of kudos to him staying in shape for it. But he shot 32% uh, from the three-point line and 81% from the free throw line. Now, he declared for the NBA draft while still maintaining his college eligibility on March 22nd. So keep that in mind. That's something important. You're going to have to keep that in mind. But uh, he became the fifth Louisville player since 1992 to have 565 points and 140 assists. He's 6'3", 180 pounds. He had 28 double-digit scoring games this past season and 13 games of 20-plus points. And in fact, when Arkansas went up against him in the Maui Invitational, which I'm sure most of you probably remember, he actually had 11 points, three rebounds, and two assists. Now, Louisville was absolutely atrocious. Like, they were an awful, a god-awful team this past season. And it was uh, really tough for, you know, for the, for you to, like, look at a player like that and say, okay, how can they, how can they, uh, you know, add him or what is he going to bring to the table and, and all of that? Well, I know that he uh, was at a community college beforehand, before he went to Louisville. And he had a lot of points there. And I know that uh, he was actually a two-time junior college All-American. So, you know, if you start looking at his entire career and his entire, entire body of work, it, it certainly looks like Ellis is a guy that's had a very interesting career so far in college basketball. Uh, I like, as weird as it is to say, I like the Juco angle because, I mean, I think about, I'm not trying to make any unfair comparisons with him, but you think about the amount of JUCO players that have come to Arkansas and have been very successful. It's a pretty long list. Uh, in fact, just recently, if you want to look at it, uh, you know, think about you know Daryl Macon and, and Jalen Barford. You know, those guys were junior college guys. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of thought to be said about guys like that, about their hunger, about their passion, uh, about uh, them wanting to to get better and better. So he's a guy that has the experience of both. Uh, major high-level college basketball, as well as being uh, at a junior college. Uh, he was the uh, number 64 transfer, and we know that as of right now, according to On3.com, Arkansas is number one in the transfer portal team rankings. Gee, I wonder why. Who would have guessed? Uh, they are ranking number one. I am, uh, I'm just, I'm impressed. I mean, I'm impressed by the numbers. I'm impressed by uh, what he's going to bring to the table, but it's it's insane to think that the way things have gone with some of these players and the experiences that they've had and what they're seeing from Arkansas, there's something that Muss is selling that they're really buying into. And we've talked a little bit about the portal guys, but this this is a whole new animal, what we're seeing right now. Um, you know, two years ago, like last year, we'll take that last year. Last year out of the portal, you got a few guys. I mean, Jalen Graham, the Mitchell Twins, Trevin Brazil. Mainly big guys or post players that came from that. But, and Ricky Council, like that was it. And some of them were kind of uh, like, I think Ricky Council, of course, was a guy that had 
uh, some offers here and there. And we know Trevin Brazil was a highly sought after player, but you know, the Mitchell twins, not really, you know, Jalen Graham was a second team, all pack 12, but you know, he was in a situation where it's kind of like, okay, uh, you know, how is he going to fit in here? You know, we don't really know much about him or, or whatever. And uh, his numbers that were there too were, you know, they were fine. But the point is, is that you got guys in, but those weren't going to be the studs. Those weren't going to be the stars that you were going to be looking at because you were essentially banking on the freshman All-Americans or the McDonald's All-Americans to be the guys that come in. And then plus Devo Davis, those were the ones you were looking at. So it was like, almost like the, you know, the, uh, the, the setup of the players last year were banking on the great freshmen and the talent and the NBA talent there. And they were just going to be nice little additions or icing on the cake. And then the year, two years before that, when you had a lot of transfers that were able to add to the piece, it's kind of the same thing because you had J.D. Note, Jalen Williams, and Devo Davis. Those were the guys you were going to lean into. And then the other guys were just going to be added nice little complimentary pieces. And even in the year before that, Moses Moody, Jalen Williams, Devo Davis, J.D. Note, Desi Sills, those are guys we're going to rely on where a guy like Justin Smith uh, we're just uh, ones that are Jalen Tate guys to lean into. That's really how it's been for us when it comes to the transfer portal. And we still have not seen the finalized roster yet, so we'll have to wait and see. But again, this is a this is a weird one where these aren't just going to be guys that you're going to kind of lean into and, and just add a little icing onto the cake. These transfers are all going to be pivotal parts of the team. Because next year you got Brazil coming back, which we I think I mean, without a doubt he's the going to be the the number one guy, the best player on the team when he's coming back. Uh, we'll see what a couple of other decisions are going to be made. But besides Brazil and I guess Jalen Graham, it's it's like all the other guys you're going to have to rely on. So I find that so fascinating that this is going to be, or at least it's setting up to be, really the first year under Eric Musselman where. The transfers are the ones that are going to be the the guys, the dudes, where as soon as you step on campus, you're it. You got to step up. Now, it's not to say that there won't be other players that will be a part of it, but the way that he's leaning into these transfers is, it, you know, you can say it's risky. You can say it, it might blow up in his face or it may go badly for Arkansas. I don't see it that way because I do trust Muss. But adding a guy like L. Ellis and, and seeing his numbers and see what he's able to accomplish, uh, as well as the other guys, which we'll talk about uh, just in general as far as how the portal goes, these are dudes that are going to make an immediate impact and be huge parts of the team to uh, not only step up and help them win games next year, but could uh, also have to be step into the leadership role. That was the thing that I know that Mus always brought up with leaders and, and leadership. Who's going to take on that role? Who's going to be that guy? We'll, we'll wait and see. but. Adding Ellis is, is just, it's crazy. It's craziness. Everybody wants to come to Arkansas. Every transfer uh, that's worth their salt has really had interest from Arkansas. And I think that there's been interest in Arkansas. I think there's a lot of reasons as to why that is. Um, but when, it, when we're te- speaking specifically about Ellis, yes, he was on a really bad basketball team. But it almost gives the vibe. I don't want to make the unfair comparison again, but it almost gives a vibe of almost like a J.D. Note type player. The dude played 36 minutes a game. He played so much. He put so much on the team on his back. He scored a ton of points. He was pretty efficient. I mean, 32% from beyond the arc, but also hitting 81% of his free throws. Uh, Did have four and a half assists per game. Then he turned the ball over a little over three times. So that's got to be, you know, lowered down a little bit. But he's, he's a bucket. Like, he's a dude that can score and score a lot and be able to facilitate too and even uh, had some uh, had some good rebounding numbers for the, considering the size of his guard and everything. So I'm trusting Muss. Uh, now that there's five of them, it's just unbelievable to think about that. But you know, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the guards and why there's so many guards and what this all means. Because I feel like that's probably what really want people want to know about and they want to hear about. Like, why is this happening? In what way? And and who is this benefiting? That's going to be the ultimate question. So, uh, but we'll talk about that. First, I got to tell you, though, folks, with Major League Baseball being here with all the grand slams, with all the no hitters, the double plays, all of that being back, you want to make some money, right? So there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. 
and you can place your first bet and you can get up to $1,000 in bonus bets back if you don't win. So take advantage of this. This is not going to be a deal that you're going to get anywhere else. And all these other betting sites are not going to be able to provide you with the great deals you can have with FanDuel when you become a very first customer. So don't miss your chance. Get the no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Sign up with FanDuel, the official partner of Major League Baseball. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, moving on into the next segment of the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Why are there so many guards? <laughs> uh, that's, I think, the question people are asking about uh, with the transfer portal is why so many guards? Why so many players? You still don't know like really what certain players are doing. Does this mean Devo's gone? Does this mean Jordan Walsh is gone? They're still trying to add more. They're still trying to add a big man because it must is not done yet out of the portal, folks. There's going to be more players added. But what does this mean? Like, why is he taking this approach? It seemed like there was some things that you could hold on to. It seemed like there were some things that you could convince to say. It seemed like there were some players that you wanted to see stick around, maybe develop, whatever it may be. But yet, this was maybe not what a lot of us anticipated, especially when it came to some of the players, uh, some of these freshman players that have said, hey, we're staying. Well, it's like, well, nah, maybe not. Maybe you're moving on. But I'm going to try to dive into the method of the madness here for Eric Musselman. It's not that he has told me anything or I I could be completely and totally off base. I just have a theory behind it and and why Muss is doing what he's doing, how he's doing it, um, and maybe where it can really benefit Arkansas. He is going out and he has gotten, without a doubt, big time scoring. You know, we could dive into what type of players they can be, but at the end of the day, all these dudes are scorers. They shoot threes. They get to the rack. They shoot free throws at a high percentage. They do a lot of things in the scoring realm effectively, each and every one of them. And that has really been the thing that I've talked about it. You've talked about it. Past few years, we've talked about it. Eric Musselman has had great ability to get his guys to play an incredible defense, which has been such a difference maker in these games. But what has really, I wouldn't even say hindered them, but what has really kept them from getting to that next level is elite scoring. They have had, in the past two seasons, you can even say three seasons, really, with the three straight Sweet 16s in the lead and two Elite Eights, which I'm not complaining about. I'm not criticize, overly criticizing them, nothing. I'm just facing the reality and the facts that you have not had enough threats in the scoring range. Like, this past season... In your Sweet 16, Ricky Council was essentially your go-to scorer. And then maybe Devo. Nothing against those guys, but neither of them I would call elite scorers. And there wasn't enough of those guys to be able to set you apart and score enough points to not only win games, but to close out games. And even the year before that, you had J.D. Note. He was really it. And then Stanley Amude on occasion. I know Jalen Williams would get uh, double doubles here and there, but I never considered him a scorer. But JD Note and Stanley Mude were really the only two. Here for that, you had Moses Moody, JD Note. The point is, is that you just never had enough scoring. You had great defense, you had some rebounders, you had some, you know, smart players, some veteran players. Like you had a lot of stuff, but you just never really had the scoring part down. And from what it looks like to me, is that Musk says, we're not doing that anymore. We're not going to have a team that we can't count on making free throws as a team. We're no longer going to have a team where if you stop one guy offensively, you stop us offensively. We're not doing that anymore. We need multiple threats. We need multiple dudes that are capable of hitting threes, hitting free throws, getting to the line, whatever it takes. We need more of that. And this is where I'm going to jump into maybe where I'm I'm overthinking it or maybe I'm completely off base. But I believe that Eric Musselman knows defense and how to play elite defense and coach elite defense better than about anybody in the country. He's up there. And I would think 
maybe his mindset is, hey, I can, if I can bring in these dudes that score at a high clip, and not everybody's like bad at on defense, so I'm not trying to say that, but if they're known for their scoring and they're known for getting buckets, I can coach them into a cohesive unit and motivate them into putting together the defense that I see fit, that will win us championships, that will win us games. The scoring is there already. I just need to mold them into the defensive players that not only they can play as individuals, but also as a team. I think it's a, a really great idea, like if, if that's the case. Again, this is just my theory. But I like the approach of it all, where it's saying, hey, we're, we need to find out ways to score more. <laughs> we don't need to be always in close games at the very end. There needs to be times where we just blow it open. There needs to be teams that when they go up against us defensively, it's like, oh, shut down this one guy and that's it. They need to be able to have to game plan for multiple players. And if you think about the five players that they're bringing in, all of them are really great scorers. Uh, some of them elite scorers. And then on top of having Trevin Brazil and Jalen Graham back, who both are for their size and, and their ability are high level offensive players. And then throwing into the mix of a couple of true freshmen that are five stars, which we'll see how much they play and what they factor into. And then. Still getting a big man, or at least still getting some more guys out of the portal. We'll wait and see. But putting that all together, I think it makes the most sense of why Muss is approaching it in this fashion. I like the idea. I like the way it's going. Now, on the other side of it, too, and this is something I actually had a discussion on my radio show about, is some of you, we're not saying everybody, but some of you hate this. I've seen comments in the YouTube video. Yet you think that Muss is, is mistreating people. Or you think that the Arkansas staff is, is kicking people off the team or telling them to leave. There's criticism saying, well, why don't you just develop players instead of you know, just doing one and done players or doing it in the portal? Like, there are some of you, not all again, but some of you that are having high-level criticisms of Eric Musselman or the staff and, and how they're approaching it, which that's fine. That's your opinion. You can have it and I can have mine because my opinion is that I don't care, Okay. As a Razorback fan and as someone who enjoys watching high-level basketball and enjoys watching great players come into this program and be a part of this program, I don't care if Muss develops one player from the next from one year to the next or if he just brings in elite players. I, I, I don't care. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about the only team in the SEC to go to three straight Sweet 16s and back-to-back -back Elite 8s. And Muss is only one of four other coaches to do that in that same span. And he's done it his way. The dude's 8-3 and three in NCAA tournament games. In the SEC, the next highest winning coach is like Nate Oates with four wins. So the fact that Muss is doing it this way, I'm putting my faith and trust in Muss. And what do I care? Honestly, what do I care? If it's a player that's been in the program for three or four years or one year player, whatever, if it means success in March, what do I care? Because ask yourself honestly, folks, ask yourself honestly. If Arkansas won a national championship this year, this upcoming season, would you give a rip about what players and like what were who were in the program for a certain amount of time? No, you wouldn't. It's about winning and it's about the college basketball culture of what it is right now. You can hate it, okay? You can hate the way it's done. You can hate the way it's changed. I, I'll understand that and I'll respect that. But you can't expect must to do that because I felt like there was so many times as much as I loved Mike Anderson and I still respected the man greatly, I felt like he was not changing with the ever-changing times of college basketball. And you have to have somebody like Eric Musselman who's adjusting with saying, hey, I'm taking whatever you're giving me. NIL, transfer portals, whatever. If I see a way of getting better players on my team, I'm going to do it. And in some cases, it's saying, hey, you know what? We appreciate what you did this past year, but it would be best served for you to enter into the portal. That includes that. Because think about this too. I wish nothing but love and appreciation for any player that transfers out of the program, especially if they're asked to. I, hope, I wish them nothing but the best of luck. But 
how many players have left Arkansas under Eric Musselman that went into the portal that ended up like being much like going out and just you regretting not having them on your team anymore. I mean, Desi Seals is probably the best success story out of that whole thing. And it took him. I mean, he was at Kansas state and and all that. And he did fine. That was great. It like worked out for him. But besides that, I mean, has there been any players that have left Arkansas under Eric Musselman where you're just like, man, that was dumb of Mus to let him go. Not really. So, it's just about putting the faith and the trust in the coaching staff. And, you, and again, you can disagree. You can, you can hate on it. You can say it's dumb. And that's fine. I love it. Because at the end of the day, I want my team to win. I want my team to win a championship. And I know you do too. Deep down inside, you know you do too. And if this is what it takes to get to that point, we're all going to be excited and happy about it. As long as they are hoisting up that national championship trophy at the end of the year, wearing that Razorback uniform with that Razorback hat, it says national champions on it. I don't care what the history was of these players and where they came from and where they were playing the year before or where they transferred from or how many years they developed under Eric Musselman. I don't care. I care about winning. And you have a coach right now in Eric Musselman that cares about the same thing. So get on board, folks. This is the way it's going to be. Like it, love it, hate it, whatever it is. It's the way it's going to be. And you just got to be on board with it. So I got I to gotta bring up some history, some bad history, because this actually came up. Speaking of basketball in the NCAA tournament, uh, there's this video clip going around. I got to show you and I got to talk about it. We'll, and we'll do that in the final segment on the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. So stay with us. You are Locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Oh, man, this one hurts. So y'all remember that Arkansas-North Carolina NCAA tournament game where North Carolina was the number one team in the country and number one seed? Or I guess they know they weren't the number one seed. No, they went. No, you're right. They went, No, I'm, you're right. As if I'm talking to you. They were not the number one seed. I'm talking to myself, apparently. They were the team that won the national championship that year in 2017. And Arkansas had a, a pretty sizable lead. I believe it was a five-point lead. With five minutes to go, something like that, or maybe an eight-point lead, but Arkansas was up, and that was really the best chance you always felt like of Arkansas making it to the Sweet 16 under Mike Anderson. Well, North Carolina came back and they won, and one of the most controversial calls that Arkansas fans will always remember about was the no call with Adrio Bailey as a true freshman, where he got ran over. It was a charge, a hundred percent charge, but nothing got called. And that was the thing. It's something that should have been. I wish I could play it back, but I'd get uh, get uh, in trouble for it on YouTube. But it was either a charge or a blocking foul or a travel. But it had to be called something. It had to be called something. Well, anyways, Justin Jackson was one of the players on that team, and he had this really interesting clip that was uh, circling on social media talking about that run, that North Carolina team, and uh, had a really really interesting comment about uh, the game against Arkansas that. Yeah, take a listen to this. That I felt even the Kentucky game, like the whole game, I didn't feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. we were going to lose it. You know what I'm saying? But it was like that Arkansas game. When you look up and we're down eight points with whatever it was, it was like I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. To this day, I don't know how we did it. I don't either. I have no idea how we did it. Shout out to those referees too during that game. Yeah, especially towards the end of the game for sure. Shout out to the referees. Shout out to the referees. Yeah, shout them out. Shout them out. And oh man, it's just like one of those things that when I hear it, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Like of all things, that gets brought up and then it's just like they understand. It's like, yeah, thanks refs. Oh, that sucks. Oh, that sucks so bad. But it just makes you think, hey, if, if Arkansas does win that game, you know, is Mike Anderson still even the, like he's still the coach? And that gets the Sweet 16. Like I felt like that was Arkansas or at least one of Arkansas's best teams for sure. But still, that was, uh, that was impressive. Is hear that and at least them acknowledge that it was uh, it was rigged or at least it was bad. But sorry if I triggered anybody and brought up some bad things, but just the way I feel and I had to play it because it still hurts so bad. It still hurts so bad. But either way, appreciate everybody listening in to Locked On Raise Your Backs podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.